Welcome. I'm Carmen Colangelo, the Ralph J. Nagel Dean of the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts. And it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome you here to this evening's event. This will be a conversation with Sabina Ekman, the William T. Kemper Director and Chief Curator of the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum, and Katerina Grossa, one of the most influential painters working today, and an artist who I've long admired. It is wonderful to be here together. It feels still like a treat to, to join in person, and certainly a treat to be in the gallery earlier with you this evening. I want to thank all of you for coming, especially those who've come from far away to be with us tonight. Uh, Katerina, it's a great pleasure to have you back here on campus again and to welcome you uh, on this very special occasion of your exhibition. Before I begin, I want to say a few words of introduction. Sabina Ekman is a curator of the exhibition, Katerina Grossa Studio Paintings, 1988 to 2022, Returns, Revisions, Inventions, which is opening to the public at the Kemper tonight, following the end of this program. Sabine is a senior scholar and specialist in 20th and 21st century art. She has authored award-winning publications and curated numerous exhibitions exploring the intersections of art, politics, historical and contemporary exile art, trauma, and media aesthetics. She is the recipient of the Emily Hall Tremaine Foundation Award for Curatorial Innovation, the College of Art Association's Alfred H. Barr Jr. Award for Outstanding Museum Scholarship, and the Association of Art Museums Curators Award for Excellence. Katerina Grossa, as I think we all know, is one of the most celebrated contemporary painters in the world. She began her career studying painting at the art academies in Munster and Dusseldorf in the 1980s, which was a pivotal time in both politics and art. As Gregory Williams explains in his essay in the exhibition catalog, it was obviously important transitional moment in both Germany and in international politics, marked by the fall of the Berlin Wall and the process of German reunification. On a far smaller, though more immediate scale for Grossa, the early 1990s was also a period of questioning how far a critical-minded painter should go in abandoning, abandoning the, or modifying traditional approaches to the medium of painting. Katerina is clearly not finished answering that question, but the process of exploring it has led her work to being collected by museums across the world. In Bern, Bonn, Brisbane, Berlin, Copenhagen, Dusseldorf, Istanbul, J Jakarta, to Munich, Stockholm, Paris, Rome, Vienna, and Zurich, as well as Baltimore, Buffalo, Dallas, Miami, Milwaukee, New York, and of course, St. Louis. You can read the full details in her bio on the museum's website and in the catalog, but I wanted to note, in just the last two years, she's had seven major international exhibitions and on-site installations. The exhibition here, however, is a little different. It is the first time to focus on Katerina's studio paintings. She is internationally renowned for her immense on-site painted works across indoor and outdoor spaces like the installation and our own Summers Athletic Center uh, that she created in 2016 as part of our Art on Campus program. From the start, her practice has also included studio-based paintings, not preparatory works, but intense explorations on canvas of the material presence, optical effects, and aesthetic potentials of color and paint. 37 of them are here in this exhibition at the Kemper Art Museum. As conceptualized by Sabine, the exhibition is organized in two thematic sections, each inspired by key elements in Ka of Katerina's painterly method. The first, returns, revisions, inventions, highlights Katerina's intuitive process-based practice. 
The other section, titled Ruptures and Fissures, emphasized the way that Katerina blurs the boundaries between canvas and the wall and its social context. The exhibition includes three of her newest works, huge fabric pieces that echo the performative nature of her studio practice. And before we begin the q and I want to take a moment to thank those who made the exhibition possible, starting with the leadership provided by the William T. Kemper Foundation. All Kemper Art Museum exhibitions are also supported by members of the director circle with major annual support provided by Emily and Ted Greenspan, and additional generous annual support from Michael Foreman and Jennifer Rice, Julie Kemper Foye, Joanne Gold and Andrew Stern, Ron and Pamela Mass, and Kim and Bruce Olson. Further support is provided by Gagosian and Gallery Nacht in St. Stefan in Vienna, the Missouri Arts Council, the Hortonais Lewin Art Fund, the Ken and Nancy Kranzberg, and members of the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum. We are deeply grateful to our lenders of the exhibition, including the National, Co National Council and Art Collection Committee member Kamal Shaw, as well as two collaborating museums, the Kunstmuseum in Bern, Switzerland, the Kunstmuseum in Bonn, Germany. In addition to lending the exhibition and contributing to the publication, Kathleen Buhler, Chief Curator at the Kunsten, Kunstmuseum Bern and Steven Berg, director of the Kunstmuseum in Bonn, will each host a version of the exhibition at their institutions after it leaves St. Leaves Louis. I extend thanks and a warm welcome to Kathleen, to Yona Ludikens from Gagosian, and Dennis Perkeman from Nation in State Symphon in Vienna. I also want to acknowledge Kat Katarina's studio members and our own museum staff as it takes a great deal of skill, teamwork, and commitment to pull off an exhibition like this. I especially want to call out uh, Natalia Martinovich, Hans Gross, Simon Menner, and Anna Swor from Katarina's studio, and Mark Ryan, Christian Good, Ron Weaver, and the entire installation team uh, from the museum. I thought we could give them all a hand at this moment. Uh, so thank you. Mm -hmm. I also want to recognize the extraordinary and fantastic catalog led by Jane Neinhardt at the museum. In close collaboration with uh, Christian Reiber at the studio and Jane's assistant, Holly Tasker. Whereas the galleries can hold only 37 paintings, the book reproduces 160 of them, combined with the essays that delve more deeply into Katerina's studio practice than has ever been done before. This bilingual publication will, will make its mark as the first reference book on the career -long aspect, this career-long aspect of, of Katerina's work. Lastly, I wanna thank Sabine and Katerina for providing this powerful, rich opportunity for all of us uh, to gather and hear from them uh, tonight. And now I want to turn it over to Sabine for what I'm sure is going to be a fascinating conversation with our truly special guest of honor, Katerina Rosa. Thank you so much, Carmen. Can you all hear me? Good. Thanks again, Carmen, for the nice um, introduction. Uh, welcome back, Katarina. It's wonderful to have you back on campus and especially this time in the museum. Congratulations to an outstanding, thoughtful, and inspiring exhibition. And I really am very grateful for this co uh, collaboration, which began quite uh, a while ago. 
The exhibition itself, as you have heard already, focuses on Katarina's studio paintings. We actually began uh, discussing it about six years ago when Katarina was here on campus uh, to paint uh, the mural in the Summers Rec uh, Creation Center, which you probably all have seen and maybe tried out. And uh, I want to show you uh, an image here of the Recreation Center. Uh, and not only that, but some other of Katarina's in situ works for which she really is internationally celebrated and everyone um, uh, identifies every in situ painting always uh, with her work. Here you see a large section uh, of the Arsenale at the Venice Biennial in 2015. And, oops, and here is Rockaway, oops, sorry. Here's Rockaway uh, in 2016 uh, um, uh, in New York, uh, a work uh, that was done in response uh, to uh, the storm Sandy. But at the same time, Katarina, you also maintained a very active studio practice. And before uh, we asked Katarina of how these two practices relate to each other, I thought it would be interesting for all of you to see uh, some documentary photographs over the years of her studio practice. And this is something um, which we also uh, encountered by uh, developing this exhibition that, that we uh, delved into her archive. And so here you see uh, that Katharina uh, actually started painting uh, figuratively uh, here in a shot of her studio in 1984. Um, here, a studio situation in Bonn in 1993, in Marfa, 1999. See? This was Marfa. And here, in Berlin, in uh, 2021. And with that, um, uh, I maybe want to turn this over to you and let you talk a little bit about these two uh, practices that really developed parallel and maybe also of how they changed over time. Yeah, um, thanks for being here tonight. Um, and thank you. I, I just want to say thank you, Carmen and uh, Sabine, for having me and having introduced the work so beautifully. And it's true, my work has always been um, a studio practice and a site-related painting practice. I um, did it very naturally while painting on an easel painting. I would try out things on a table, on the floor, uh, and go over to the windowsill while being on the phone, you know. <laughs> so, um, and I always thought that the things I did on the floor were so much better, <laughs> uh, so much more loose, so much more um, direct also, you know. And uh, I had a teacher who always said, get better than your floor paintings. And that kind of inspired me maybe even to go, yeah, maybe there is something that makes, that inspires you when you're doing it somewhere else, but on that designated surface that is supposed to be the best surface for your work. And uh, I started to realize that when also going to museums, which I did a lot when I was young, that a lot of paintings were done on carved uh, wooden sculptures in the German medieval pa uh, times, for example. So the, the painted sculpture, you know, Mary's clock, cloak being blue. And then what if it was orange? You know, that kind of temptation. Um, and then as a kid, you would scribble a lot, you know, on your um, father's design or not design so far, or, you know, so all these things, or you, you make marks on your skin, phone numbers, but then the phone number turns into a drawing and then you think it is really interesting how the pen sinks into the skin and then you have to rub it off with a brush and all these notions are fantastic, are inspiring, so I went to houses that were about to be torn down as a student, I would make large, large charcoal drawings. Uh, I just used the surfaces that were there and I didn't care whether the work would disappear. And then I would take things from there into the studio and would try it out on the canvases and I made sculptures as well. I made things out of clay, out of um, gesso. Uh, uh, I would use even old um, 
a, a wax techniques. I heard uh, at art school how mummies were uh, painted. Uh, so I bought uh, uh, candles. Yeah, yeah I call, uh, bought candles and filled them with pigment and uh, painted sculptures with um, sculptures with uh, pigmented wax. I took it off again. So I had a lot of experiences gathered around these questions of the sculptural surface. And at some point, it started to be. Um, a very important part of my work. Um, I had spent time in Florence. I see that the school also has studios in Florence, which I think is great. So you get to know a lot of um, wall paintings, frescoes, a very um, mundane way to, way to live with a painted image, with an image that is uh, something else than a sheer information sheet, but something that evokes maybe um, something about the depth of life and of imagination or of dreaming or of a layer of uh, unreal reality, you know, that can maybe inform uh, thoughts that might then use you use to, to develop things that are actually starting to be something else, like a screw or a special technique. Or, and you can even see here with this studio um, photograph how much actually there is a fluid a transition between a painted, intentionally painted painting that is a rectangular surface on a canvas and that um, it has a residue that's natural, that is outside the surface of the painted painting, and that residue is meaningful for me, and I use it for things outside the studio. So even that looks like a wall painting in a certain way, and um, that resonates and gives me information on things I want to do later. I don't make a big difference between these two things, but they are different, and they are different in the making, and they are different in dimensionality and scaling, and they are also different in the way that uh, they are used and that they survive, because the wall painting doesn't. Thank you. I think scale really is a very important part, and we talked over the last uh, several days a lot about scale, and maybe we will come back to that uh, a little bit uh, today, but before we do so, I think it would be interesting for us to learn a little bit more about how uh, everything started in the exhibition itself, um, and I will show this one more time. I have a little problems with this clicker, so... Um, just bear with me. Uh, uh, some uh, of the earliest paintings in the exhibition, um, a very small one, and already in 1992, a pretty large one, uh, where Katarina uh, experimented with layers of color. And I want to keep um, this image up here, where you see her very early on in the 90s, uh, painting still with a paintbrush but one attached to a stick pretty far, uh, actually removed uh, uh, from your body as well. And so although the exhibition is only loosely organized chronologically, uh, but has also this kind of emphasis on um, important um, processes uh, in uh, your practice, I thought it would be nice uh, to hear a little bit more of how it all started and why you thought you would want to become a painter. Yeah, um, I started late in life to paint, you know. I wasn't like the wonder child at one age one making little self-portraits, you know. <laughs> I started at the age of 20. My mother kind of discovered a little drawing on my um, desktop, uh, on my, not desktop, <laughs> no, I was um, on my writing desk, and she said, maybe that's something, maybe you want to come with me on an excursion and we paint outside. And I had never done it before, and I was a little bit, it was the times when I wanted to go to university, I didn't know what to do, I thought I was... Um, I thought I was a genius, and at the same time, I wasn't, you know. So um, I was uh, very interested in literature and languages and uh, self-confident, and yet I didn't know what to do. So it's a weird mixture of insecurity and self-conviction, and that didn't get me anywhere. And then I went painting, and it transported me into a zone that I didn't know at all. I had no uh, knowledge about it, and that was good. Uh, so I was really fresh, and, and and it appealed to me that I could use my body. I sat in a trench, you know, painting a willow tree for about seven hours, and the guy that was teaching me picked me up again in his car and said, yeah, it's good. Um, you could have also painted that other tree, you know, that was behind you. Why did you only paint that one tree? And I thought, oh, 
that's powerful, you know, I can put all the trees I want <laughs> into that uh, painting. And that started to be something that resonated with me as a little child, you know, when you paint the roof, you think the roof only exists if you fill it in with red. Before that, you know, you have these little games with yourself, and all of a sudden that came all back to me, that these experiences I've had with visual um, activities, and I really full-on started to paint and do it all the time. I forgot to read books, I, forgot to, I even was very much anti-reading, I thought, oh, that reading is linear, but what I need for painting is very much like um, a compact time unit. It is so different to be in the studio and to keep all the threads of the different things you do on the surface in your mind, like in a very um, active chess game where all the moves are present, you know. So um, I thought it would hinder me to study theory. So I didn't learn anything about theory. I uh, only went to museums to look at things. So my visual um, intelligence was really um, exposed and expanded and, uh, and the other things I had to then later on, you know, to read again. And I had to really learn how to read again. But it was very fascinating. And, um, um, and there was a moment when I... Um, I tried everything, you know. I also went to the uh, film department. I did video. There was Nam Jun Paik teaching at the school where I was. And there was photography was very important. Uh, uh, Richter, um, Gerhard Richter was teaching. So the idea of photography in relationship to painting was super um, present, uh, discussed all the time. Um, and I wasn't sure whether I was really knowing what it was I wanted to do. And then I, I left Germany, I went to live abroad, which was a good thing again. So I was in a zone that was unknown to me, different languages, different cultures. And I started fresh from zero, and I realized the only thing that is really constantly reoccurring occurring in my work is the color is the intensity of color, the presence of color, the seductiveness, the viscerality of it. And that's how I um, restarted my practice, with only having 10, 15 colors pre-mixed in big buckets and large paintbrushes, and I started to do very simple movements on the surface. And so that's when my body movement became to be more and more visible in the work, the way that I behaved in front of the canvas was starting to be um, interesting to me. You know, I thought maybe it already starts here before I even hit the surface. So um, it's fascinating. To, you have a thought, you take orange for that painting, and then you go to that painting, and just before you hit it, you go over to that one and paint there, you know. So this idea that your thoughts change when you move towards your goal started to be something for me that I looked at and um, how do I actually convince myself to stay with what I have decided or do I go with a change of decision making while I'm in the process. And so I realized that um, a very clear goal that I thought I would achieve in a work is not really for me because I change my intentions while I work. So the um, idea of an ideological um, uh, conviction or manifesto wouldn't get me anywhere, but a very clear set of tools that opens up a situation that then can bring in other thoughts would be a suitable method for me. So that's how I actually started to be really convinced maybe I could do something in painting. When you started painting in the late 1980s and the mm. 1990s, the, I would think the entire art world was still dominated um, by the celebration of um, what is often called um, neo-expressionism, uh, many male painters really dominating the, uh, that field. But there were also neo-conceptual practices and the so-called contextual uh, uh, paintings um, happening in Germany. Was it hard, uh, did you feel at the time um, that you were a woman and that it was hard for you to find a place um, in this kind of artistic uh, context and uh, to really be recognized and um, establish yourself? Yeah, I mean, 
I thought I was beyond feministic questions, you know. I thought I was so evolved, you know. I mean, I grew up in a family with two boys. My parents were very, very super with us, you know. And I grew up in, a, in the rural area, very industrial area. I didn't really see that thing, uh, the, the differences so clearly, also as a young person. And in the art school, I didn't see it either. And I got a lot of questions from friends of mine that said, you can't be a painter. No way. It is so dominated by a history that um, recognizes um, the authorship towards the socially male uh, connotated authors. And, I, and then when I did other works, I, couldn't, I wanted to paint, so that was sure, for sure. Uh, but um, I think I was so involved in the questions of the expressive as you say, the expressionist um, figurative painting of the 80s. And I did do that painting as well. I adored the people that did it. They were my idols. And then I transformed that um, energy of the expressive figure into my own movement. And I did do some um, performance classes with very good performers of those days, with Ulrike Rosenbach. I don't know whether some yeah. of you know her. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I studied with her for um, half a year, really every day. And that was really also a, re a very important a part of my um, upbringing, I think. I was very interested in theater as a little child. We, my parents would take us to the um, theater. So you would see Shakespeare as a five-year-old, and you were fascinated, of course, but for other reasons than you are now, maybe, you know, highly dramatic, uh, you have little sweat pearls on your forehead because <laughs> things are happening all the time, and, you know, so I was very interested, or dance theater was very big in the 80s in Germany, so Pina Bausch, I saw very early on, she was very close to where I lived, and uh, they threw um, buckets of water around and talked and sang and danced and crawled and took their clothes off and put them back on and people were thrown in the air, you know. It was, uh, so there was also um, a feel of the borders weren't so clear. Is it dance? Is it music? Is it uh, theater? Is it performance? Um, there was a great openness. So I wasn't so interested in these questions. Is it possible as a woman to such and such? You know, I wasn't so, I didn't like the idea of categorizations too much, you know. And, um, and I couldn't handle it so well because, as I said, my theoretical background wasn't so strict. You know, I was so visual. I was so um, fascinated by anything, actually. And uh, it started later to be uh, more of an issue, as I saw that the reception of the work was uh, more difficult for me uh, being a woman. I think that is still the case, yeah. that we have a different visibility and, um, yeah. Well, let's go back to your actual artworks. One more time. Uh, one focus uh, of your early paintings is the experimentation with layers of paint and how different colors behave on top and below each other. Uh, you were never really interested in mixing paints, but more in complicating relations between surface and subsurface, top, top and below, and in between. And you also, already very early on, did that in... Um, in situ uh, uh, situations, which, you know, did you come up with some painterly problems or tasks that you wanted to tackle by really focusing on this layering, which I really think until today became, you know, is very characteristic uh, for your work and probably today you do it automatically. Um, so I was just wondering uh, what how you came to it, and if, if there was really, if you saw it as a problem to be solved, or was it more also an experiment, a process? Yeah, it was actually, um, like I was absolutely um, fascinated by the idea of underpainting, you know, so in classical painting, when you see a Rubens figure, it has like dark earth underneath, and then there is maybe a, a white coming on top, so that the uh, dark surface brings the light and the white to shine or have um, uh, plasticity. So um, this kind of obsession with um, old works that I had early on maybe made me um, 
think of underpainting. And I was even a little bit ridiculed by my friends who said, "Ah, oh, you're doing an underpainting again, you know? So I was, when I saw a face and I would paint a face, the first colors that came to mind were red, blue, dark green, uh, yellow, and I would not start with the, the, the um, top tones that you could see. I would not see the surfaces. And that made me understand after a little while that I actually can't see the individual feature. I can't see a person. I always see clusters. So that's why I also got away from my figurative early practice, because I realized I can't see singular features. And um, so the underpainting is something that is so fascinating because you're going like deep down and pull something up and then you think, ah, and that's just the beginning. You know, the underpainting is only the start. But I never got beyond the underpainting in a sense in my work. So this idea that um, uh, a red takes part of the yellow away and then the blue takes part of the red away and that these are constantly in, in an infight, you know, before it comes to something that you would, would find descriptive or de, um, representative. That was uh, taking all my attention in a sense. And, um, and in the end, I, I'm still um, in the realm of the underpainting, I think in a way, you know. <laughs> so the, the light that is coming through a very saturated color, would you paint it over? You would have it shine through, but I'd never paint it over to that extent. Mm. What uh, I would like to, uh, for all of us, um, sort of also use this Q&A, obviously, to highlight a little bit uh, what the exhibition wants to put forth here. And uh, that is um, that you basically developed uh, a vocabulary of forms um, that rec uh, return in recognizable um, yet always altered way to ultimately lead to new images. And um, I think, and you can see these two works in dialogue in the exhibition, uh, even between your very early organic forms, like in this 1992 painting and one mm. of your cut canvases, um, you can, specifically when you see the, them in person in the gallery, you can see that um, they're, it, that it still goes back, that there's still, you know, a reference back to these earlier forms, although they have been altered in very radical ways. Um, and we make uh, similar connections in the gallery, uh, for example, also between uh, this um, kind of uh, grid painting and then uh, a painting in which uh, you already used the, spray, uh, the spraying machine, uh, but in which this, uh, these grid, uh, gridded forms reappear in fragments. And then we have another example in the exhibition here um, where um, parts of these forms return but in completely altered ways. Um, and I've, why I thought that this is so interesting is um, that you sort of really bring us back um, to really this kind of challenge to learn to see again. And I think we also um, are not really able very often to engage in a focused uh, way in seeing because we are on our phones all the time. We are watching quick video uh, clips and so forth, but we are not focused on em uh, anymore to really seeing and also seeing difference. And your paintings encourage actually this seeing uh, difference. And now maybe a complicated question. So I was wondering, you know, if this experimentation and fluid process, what informs your uh, practice, if this is sort of replacing the picture as a form, as some established form, but because very often um, we engage or look at a picture as a, at a painting as something of a finalized form. And your process seem uh, to be exactly the opposite. So I don't know if that's a question you would want to engage with. <laughs> I, I don't know whether it's a question. I mean, it's. Um, I certainly do not un think that the work is uh, complete in the sense that it refers to a set of rules that is only valid within the parameters of the image or the canvas or the field be it a large site-related thing. I don't think that this is how I see my work. I think it is also um, 
um, it is broken, kind of. It is not complete in the sense that the rules can be, uh, they have to be uh, completed, I think, these uh, param yeah, the, the um, assumptions they make in the work by either looking at them or by, looking, by finding something in your imagination that um, connects with the painting, maybe. Um, I use a spray gun. It's a tool coming from the mundane world. It's a, a tool to cover large surfaces in a very short amount of time. Uh, it's not very intimate. It's um, something anybody can <laughs> use, of course as a paintbrush, can be used by anybody as well. But I mean, I, it's, um, it's uh, something that uh, uh, um, connects with uh, printing techniques, with um, wind, with dust, with uh, something none... Uh, it's not related to painting per se, to painting a picture. Right, that's what uh, I thought. I think that's what, other where things I are wanted used, to get right? to. Yeah. Because um, also when you study one... Um, painting in particular, you often look back to uh, preparatory studies for this painting and then there are like 10 studies and all of a sudden then there is this finalized painting. Well, in yeah, your I case, mean, mm. it, is, it seems to be a more fluid process that even when we arrived at the finalized painting afterwards, parts of this painting can appear somewhere else again. Yeah, but that is um, something that is... Um that is probably the case for any kind of oeuvre of an artist, I would think, right? But I'm, I think maybe coming back to the idea, where does the, uh, the painting sit? You know, that is maybe the question that is connected to that. So where, if you look at that um, area, you know, I think that the painting is actually also existent outside that periphery, uh, that area. You know, I think you can see it probably on that surface, on the designated, um, be it a canvas or a field, that is part of the show. But um, my, I like to see my activity coming from somewhere else into that area. It's not like that I'm painting in the area and then all of a sudden I'm so courageous, I'm going outside. It's, not, it's the other way around. Mm. So I think that um, the space that I envision for my uh, painting to be um, the studio space in that se metaphorical sense is really huge. It's some from somewhere else, you know. I like this large... Uh, uh, scale is not even a f question of is it now uh, 10 feet or 30 feet. It's really thousands of feet, you know, <laughs> where I then somehow land on that surface. Mm. I had already forwarded uh, the slide a little bit uh, to one of your uh, spray paintings. I did want to talk a little bit of co uh, about color, but you have already touched upon that in, uh, in an earlier uh, comment of how important uh, color to you is because of its uh, really visceral, uh, sensuous uh, quality. So I don't know if we really necessarily need to go back there. I know our time is a little limited, and um, and I we just for you all to know. Of course, we will open this Q and A at some point uh, to the audience for questions. Uh, but um, what I think is um, important here is. Very often, um, and we have touched upon that uh, yesterday a little bit, uh, very often your practice uh, is really described until 1998 when you switched or when you um, uh, found uh, uh, the spraying uh, technique as something which really will work genuinely for your practice um, and that there was something like a break. Um, but in reality, you, you know, basically also continued painting uh, with brushes. And so I was more wondering, when did you decide, or is there a decision when to use one, when you used one technique over the other, or um, uh, both, no, I think because it both is, sort of yeah. continued in, in some kind of parallel way. But maybe also the brush painting um, changed through uh, the way you could, um, use the spraying technique? I mean, I understand the questions that you ask, but I think it is not such a, I mean, you know, as a, it's like asking uh, somebody, why do you use a, vi I mean, it's um, not, I'm not interested in the technique, you know? It's like, um, of course, they have different consequences, but um, it is so organic. It is, uh, the spray paint is, 
Um, the gun provides an infinite amount of uh, paint throughout the process, uh, whereas the paintbrush, uh, the brush is exhausted after one stroke. It is not touching the surface. There are so many differences. You're so fast. You're enlarging your body by the spray. You're ga gaining distance. You're gaining uh, time. You're, um, you can mix paint colors in a different way. The droplets go into the surface of another color without being smeared in it. You know, there is a lot of different things that happen in spray painting. And it's just, uh, for me, the most um, amazing tool to also find always different ways to use it. It is almost as if um, uh, it is so close to me that um, I could do a spray painting course, if you like, and yeah. explain it to you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I think, um, of course, it is. there is a paradigm shift using the mm. two different um, models of applying, of touching the surface, of actually approaching the surface, mm. of understanding a surface, mm. I do think, of course. Yeah, maybe I wasn't so clear. Mm -hmm. I think it was more also that just at looking at, at these two paintings that I always had a little bit the feeling that the way you use the brush also changed from the moment on uh, you use the spraying technique because there are these very transparent all of a sudden layers of paint and they have a fluidity which yeah, is I'd, not there yeah. in their earlier painting. Mm. So that was more at what I was sort Yeah, of, I think that, that is more, um, uh, totally true. Mm. Um, anything you do does... I mean, later on I was doing very large watercolors and then I discovered um, that the medium of the water makes the pigment travel and that is very close to how um, air makes the pigment travel, but it's oh. a different medium, you know. So it is all... Um, I'm not doing very different things throughout my last 30, 40 years. It's just from different perspectives, you know, and different ways of looseness and tightness and uh, a better uh, decision-making process maybe I have started to uh, develop throughout the years, I think. I think I want to get to some of uh, mm. Mm, some core <laughs> uh, uh, ways uh, through which uh, you um, expanded or challenged what we usually understand um, a painting uh, to be. And so from the very beginning, uh, you disregarded the physical borders of the actual canvas. Uh, but then I want, and I want to show just some images. That is actually what we are highlighting in the second uh, section of the exhibition. But then there were all these, also these canvases um, where you walked into the wet paint with the special shoes uh, made. And then around 2010, you started working extensively with stencils that you applied uh, to the canvas uh, and then removed after uh, you finished or uh, finished paintings and uh, a painting. Um, and here you can see uh, the studio Oops. Uh, full with some of uh, these uh, stencils, but you also used um, dirt uh, and had the dirt actually um, also create parts of the painting. Mm. Um, uh, so basically the soil was a co-creator, we could say, of some of your uh, work. And uh, most recently, um, you also applied and included uh, tree branches um, into, uh, into your paintings. Uh, or on the right for you, we see a kelp that was first applied uh, to the canvas and later removed. And most recently, um, you started working with uh, cut canvases that you stacked on top of each other so that we don't um, see actual um, empty spaces made through stencils, but the wall becomes uh, the uh, part of the painting. Um, so I think uh, my question is, and you started talking about this a little bit or, already, does do all these methods in one way or the other also connect your practice more to our um, um, social, uh, to the social fabric in which we are embedded to the world, to the realities um, with which we have to deal every, so you bring them somehow into your practice and create maybe a dialogue uh, between them and uh, the practice of painting. 
Yeah, I think that um, a painting isn't in a bubble, um, excluded from our life and our experiences. It is um, a reflection in a, um, on, on different levels, and I'm very fascinated by the, fa by the way that a painting can be anywhere in our life. So that's why I'm also so interested in painting on walls or floors or a parkland or, or in the studio. Um, I think these are all very different uh, ways of making, um, of thinking about how we live together. And a painting appearing in our life, uh, when I painted, for example, over my bedroom at one day, that was a real game changer for me because I painted something over that was my everyday, uh, that was important for me. The bedroom was the most important thing apart from my studio for many reasons. <laughs> but one of them being that it is the, the space in the apartment which I used the most, you know, because I was just sleeping, getting up and going somewhere in the studio. And so there were my books, there were my clothes, there were my suitcases, everything, and I would paint over it. And I I found that amazing that the pictorial feel that I could create with color would be sitting on something that was were objects, that was a story of my day, of my night, that were the books I read. So the confrontation of my life, my very personal life, and that kind of painting I had developed up to then was so um, uh, strong and uh, so clear and so not exclusive. They could sit on top of one another, even though they were two completely different ways to look at life. So it was as if you look from here and there, you have these sometimes these magnifying glasses and you turn them around. It was a little bit like I put those two lenses together into one image. And so I do think that um, it is important that a painting that has this kind of strangeness of the sheer color uh, world coming to the question of a coffee cup or a book cover or a sock left on the floor and you paint it over and all of a sudden the colors dissolve the object uh, contours and uh, create a new hierarchy of all these things I see. And yet the things I can see or discern are still there. So my painting doesn't erase the given situation. It is creating a, an ecology with it. And I think that is a way of thinking that you can't erase what you don't like. But my painting, of course, is, always, is also a certain, um, is a gesture of I'm not okay, you know. I don't want to see this. But then it mm. becomes far more visible. So um, there is actually a way of looking at something that is almost um, utterly uncomfortable for me, that I paint on something with my painterly practice. I confront my painterly practice with um, things I'm not um, clear with. I'm, I, I find a crisis, so to speak, mm. even in, in the paintings themselves. And I find this kind of a paradox of something that is beautiful and yet at the same time difficult to bear. I find this paradox very fascinating. And I think that is uh, very much um, reflecting, from my point of view, what I, how I experience life and the world. And it's just a proposal, you know, you look at it, and if, you, if it does something to you, that's a good thing, and if it doesn't, you have to look at somebody else's art. Uh, they, are just, um, <laughs> yeah, they are just alternatives, you know? We are, we are proposing alternatives to, um, to situations. Well, thank you. I think we want to skip a couple of the slides, but I do want to uh, maybe quickly go to the large-scale uh, silken fabric prints that you can all see in the atrium of the museum. Um, here, these uh, early installation uh, photographs uh, were made in Berlin in the, sum the summer in July uh, when we tested uh, these uh, 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 large-scale um, uh, fabric uh, prints um, out and uh, to see if they would fit uh, in the museum. So now here we have a bit, a bit of a different uh, dialogue. I mean, mm -hmm. first of all, of course, we did choose them and uh, Katarina produced them in order to also connect uh, these um, digitally um, manipulated uh, photographs 
to the theme of studio paintings. So uh, uh, you see um, uh, a fragment of uh, the studio wall. You can see an unfinished uh, painting, and you can see um, uh, the painting in process. Uh, but here you really work with photography. You work with printing um, uh, techniques. Uh, and put them in dialogue with painting. First, when you see, uh, when, you've, uh, uh, when you go into the atrium in a, a couple of minutes, uh, you first think these are really paintings floating there. They're very, uh, you know, intense, uh, but in reality, they're photographs. Uh, so how, you know, why did you get interested maybe in this dialogue also um, with a photography um, and uh, your uh, uh, your painted work, yeah, um, it's it's a little bit of a story because I, I used to make a lot of um, documentary um, work, uh, photographs of my uh, disappearing <laughs> site related practice, and through those different ways of photographing them, videoing them, or um, writing about them, the work would live on or could be still discussed because it is kind of a disadvantage as well that your work disappears. It can't be connected to things that come later, they can't be revisioned yeah, again, you know, so um, it is very fascinating that um, I once met Dave Hickey and he said it's such a pity your work disappears. It's 50% of your oeuvre is gone so it can never be um, in relationship to anything else that's coming mm. later and um, I, was, I, thought, I thought I was radical, that I was so okay with <laughs> having the work disappear, but it got me thinking. And um, uh, I started to think of um, a space as such a rigid thing, you know, very early on with these three dimensions that make up the Euclidean space with the rectangles. And um, I was always thinking that if a painting appears in a space, it has to articulate a different, a different usage of space because a painting itself has different rules, spatial rules. They are not, they can't be measured. They are more mm -hmm. like an apparition of, uh, or the notion of what could be a spatial depth or, um, or distance to your eye or whatever. And um, so I was thinking of techniques to soften space or disguise it. And that's when I started also to use the photographic documentary of other wall paintings that I once started, took um, my earliest um, spray painting and reproduced it all, almost one to one and had it printed on silk and had it installed about like two feet away from the wall. And so it would actually sit in front of the wall that would normally and traditionally host that painting. Mm. So it would cover where it normally sits. So lo the location of the painting was disguised and was softened. And as you walk by, it moves with the air of your body passing by. And uh, it's neither a strict, uh, tense photograph, nor is it uh, really um, an original in that sense, but it evokes um, the um, sense of it. And, um, and then I started to do a different photography as well. I, so I, I, I did things with my hands. My hands are very important of course, <laughs> to all our hands are important. So the hand, is, <laughs> I mean, the hand is such an amazing, as we know now from brain uh, 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 science, that it's, things happen here for earlier than they do in our brain. So there is an amazing book. Do, have you read the book, The Hand? I think it's even the cover uh, is The Hand. And yeah, so well, anyway. So I was, uh, how to hold um, a reproduction, which is on the right-hand side, or how, um, a, a hand is painted that paints, for example, all these things are also games I play with myself. And I thought it would be great to have something in the show that refers to that other practice on the one hand and at the same time refers to paintings that are in the show. And we are using reproductions or even smaller images on our handhelds all the time to think and discuss work. I mean, in our d daily discussions, it's almost like a normal thing to speak and show things at the same time. Um, and uh, swivel around, and I thought that um, uh, that uh, these three little pieces are uh, 
almost like a theater prospect, like in the old days when you had three or four yeah, prospects and would walk through there, like a little notion of a stage as well. So we walk through the work, through the paintings, through a book. And the show is so densely and beautifully hung by you, Sabina, I really have to say that it's almost as if you walk through a, cat you walk through a catalog, you know, you log walk through a timeline of a certain um, a person's life and uh, that is just all of a sudden as if you have a magnifying glass and it pops up really big and then it goes back to the original size. Thank you. Uh, maybe my last question, we really have to open this up uh, to the audience and there are already questions, but maybe very quickly, um, for me um, as a curator for, of this exhibition and uh, when we, you know, uh, worked in Berlin and when you pulled some paintings, I, you know, saw them without context and so seeing them here together in the gallery and um, seeing of also how they establish a dialogue with each other. Um, I'm still learning actually about the paintings. And uh, so I was wondering, do you see your work now a little different by seeing all these paintings together uh, from the 1990s to the present? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'll keep it. We'll, we'll keep it uh, at this. Uh, uh, there are some questions, David. Uh, I wanted to ask you about your color selection. Your later works have a wide variety of colors in them, and my question is: Is it impulse, or is there a, a theory of color that you have in selecting the colors for any one particular work? Yeah, that's a great question. It's um, impulse. It's no theory. Can Oh, there's always um, somebody who I really admire. Like right now, I, um, I was very impressed by Laurie Anderson's work at the Smithsonian, that somebody like of her age and career and amazing um, uh, diversity of thought and practice would come up and paint the whole museum and write stories. And also her lectures, I thought, were really amazing, the way she talks about her life. And, uh, how her artistry has developed, so I think she is amazing. That is somebody I really cherished, and um, I think a lot of things are really uh, amazing, and some of my friends who are sitting here in the audience know that I love soccer, I love the strategy, I like how people um, anticipate the, the, the other players' movements, how they are ab able to, over a long distance, rehearse and uh, and work together, I think that is uh, super fascinating for me. I love uh, any kind of strategic game, for example. Um, but in terms of artists, I mean, it can every, I just went to Ravenna and saw the mosaics there, and I thought that was really amazing to see these so brilliant and uh, visceral images up in the ceiling in, in these brick buildings. They're almost like screens, you know? They were so intense and beautiful. So it can be anything that is, um, but the, the Ravenna mosaics, they stay with me right now, so. <laughs> yes. An amazing woman. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Tell me about your pants. Um, <laughs> I love your pants. I was, I was a little afraid when you said, you're an amazing woman, and I was waiting for the butt. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, me too. And tell me all about Yeah, they are by a German designer who lives in Paris. I can't remember her name. But, <laughs> yeah. I will, I will check it out and send you the, the link. Yeah. Here's another question. Yeah, I want to make a remark. Uh, the paintings, um, they, to me, they make me think, I recall Einstein putting energy and matter together to make the matter equation. The that equation it dances by itself without even knowing what it's all about. And that's what I love about your work. I'm seeing or historically at the, the painting on the right, on my right, uh, I think of the Sistine Chapel creation and energy. 
there's that half of this mysterious being that people call God. Uh, it's the half of creation. It's very, I'm enjoying the work in the Oh, thank you very much. It's very kind. Thank you. I think with that, the exhibition is open. <laughs> <laughs>